This presentation is showing the slide deck that was presented at the Conex 2013 conference in Santa Barbara, California. This is joint work with my co-authors listed on this slide. We are presenting our paper, An Automated System for Emulated Network Experimentation. So what we're talking about is network experimentation. Why would someone want to experiment? There's a number of users that could benefit from network experimentation. These include researchers, being able to set up network experiments easily, particularly for reproducible research, where their research can be carried out multiple times, modified, holding one variable constant to follow the scientific method, and presented for other researchers to both validate the experiment and to build on in their own research. Network operators can also benefit from having a sandbox to test with. This allows them to test out network changes before deploying to production or to learn about their network. It's generally a career limiting move to carry out a network experiment on a production network. Educators can also benefit providing a system for their students to be able to play with networks and learn how they work. So how can we experiment? There are a number of options available depending on the scale and realism required. At one end of the spectrum are hardware networks in which physical hardware devices are purchased and connected together. This provides a high degree of realism. While we may not carry the same data plane traffic as a production network, the same equipment that would be used is available. However, this comes at a cost. They are prohibitively expensive, often placing them out of the budget of smaller network operators, researchers and educators. Even for large network operators, there's often limited ability to access lab hardware. At the other end of the scale, we have simulations, where one algorithm or component of a network protocol's behavior is emulated in a simulation system. This provides a high degree of scale, since only a small amount of resources is used per device. However, there's limited realism. We're not running the same control plane algorithms that are used in production networks with the same configuration, we do not have the same hardware. Somewhere in between lies emulation, in which the real router operating systems that will be run on a production network are used. However, these are run inside a virtual machine. This provides a good balance between the two. We get some of the realism of hardware networks. We are configuring them in the same way, and they'll behave the same for protocol packets coming through. However, we can get the benefits of the simulation in that we only require a virtual machine with significantly less resources. We can run these on commodity hardware devices. We do not carry the same traffic and we're unable to have the same traffic level performance as a hardware network. However, emulation can offer valuable insights into experimentation with control plane algorithms. To emulate a three router network, we would take the router operating system running on those routers and run them inside a virtual machine as a routing process. These virtual machines are then connected together, providing the network connectivity. These routing operating systems often do not even realize they're running inside a virtual machine. The hardware in such as the line cards presented them to make differ. However, the packets passed between them would be the same. So the same control plane configuration and implementation can be used. This can be very valuable for realistic control plane experimentation. One such option for an emulated network is NetKit. This runs Quagga, an open source routing stack, inside user mode Linux virtual machines. These can run then inside a Linux host machine. The advantage of user mode Linux is that it's quite efficient in its resource usage. A Quagga virtual machine acting as a virtual router can require as little as 32 megabytes of RAM. This allows large scale topologies to be created on commodity hardware. This network emulation allows us to quickly and easily create large-scale networks. For instance, here's the slide from the NetKit teaching laboratories running a BGP small internet. In this lab, there are seven autonomous systems, each representing a different network operator, with 14 routers. These routers are running protocols such as OSPF, IBGP, and eBGP. As an experiment, our team manually configured this network. It took approximately two days to write out each of the configurations. Many of these were copy and paste with subtle variations. We then spent an additional half a day to test and debug these, primarily through running pings and trace routes to check for any small errors that could have been made in the IP addressing entering or in the configurations themselves. There is much repeated effort here. This time consuming process is due to the problem of configurations. A user must convert a high level goal, such as their routing policy to achieve a business or technical goal into the low level syntax to program each device. This is a repetitive task. It's slightly different for each device, 
but it's of critical importance. A small mistake is very easy to make, but can have severe consequences and can be subtle to detect. Sometimes these mistakes may only crop up when an outage occurs. As an illustration of router configurations, this slide shows configurations for three router types. On the left we have the open source Quagga, on the top right we have Cisco IOS, and on the bottom right we have Cisco IOS XR. For Quagga, the configurations are configured per routing protocol. This configuration file shows the ospfd.conf configuration. To set the cost for the OSPF routing protocol, such as for traffic engineering purposes, we set that on the physical interface block within the OSPFD config file. For iOS Classic, there's only one configuration file, but we are also running a very similar command, IP OSPF, and then the cost inside the physical element configuration. For iOS XR, we don't set it inside the interface. It's actually set inside the OSPF router configuration stanza and is grouped by the area. We then inside the area set it on the interface. Conceptually, it's quite easy to relate these between each platform. However, if we were to copy and paste or to do a low-level network translation of configurations, these subtle differences can make it quite complicated. The solution is instead of working for each configuration file, is to create an automated experimentation platform. This is what we are presenting. The desired properties that we would have of this platform are that it's available and that it's open source. We'd like it to be modular and flexible so that we can integrate existing research and adapt to new protocols. On a similar level, we'd like it to be generic. We're not tied to any specific protocol implementation. This allows us to add new protocols, new services, and new hardware to target devices to map to different configuration files. We'd like it to be easy to use, large scale, so we can configure large networks, and allow for rapid experimentation where we can change a component and quickly see the output result. We'd also like it to be transparent, so it's easily scriptable and visible the actions taken throughout. There are many existing solutions in this space. We'll provide a quick overview here and their role to network experimentation. The simplest solution is a scripted solution in which we have the resource allocations, such as the OSPF cost or IP addresses stored in some form of resource database. We then have a set of configuration templates for each network element, such as iOS or Quagga. An automated script takes the configuration templates and interpolates the resources applicable to that device. The output result is router configuration files. This helps with the problem of transferring the resources in the resource database into the configuration files. However, we run into problems with specifying the resources. We need a way to be able to express the IP addresses. They must follow patterns such as being unique throughout the network but balanced across links or OSPF costs in which we wish to have them follow a certain pattern for traffic engineering purposes. These become hard to do using a flat resource database. The challenge is how do we set those resource allocations in that resource database. A number of commercial solutions exist for network configuration management. These are typically proprietary. We cannot see what is going on underneath and don't have access to script and extend them. Generally they're GUI driven, making it harder to automate for large networks. This is particularly important for experimentation where we wish to rapidly deploy similar but subtly different topologies to carry out experiments. And these commercial solutions are generally not designed to be extensible to support new protocols or new target platforms easily. This is something that's quite important for experimentation where we may wish to add new devices in to compare how they work and also to integrate analysis such as research into stability of routing protocols or visualization of that data. There's also been significant research in the configuration generation and the broader problem of network configuration. A very quick summary is presented here. In the Presto system, the logic was embedded in the templates. This made it complicated to do network-wide reasoning and protocol design. NCGuard provided a system based on XML using XSLT transforms, primarily focused on network validation. Other solutions are NetSQL database-based. The trouble becomes expressing network-wide goals into a network database schema such as SQL. Some other solutions are fragment configlet based. These are very much coupled to the device syntax of the target device, making it hard to carry out reasoning at the network level of the protocols. There are model finding approaches in which an optimization is used to find and to solve a set of constraints. These are limited in the transparency. They can often find the optimal solution. However, it's hard to see exactly how this is being performed and to tweak this, especially for a network operator. 
and the scalability suffers. These are frequently combinatorial in their complexity. Other tools are focused on specific protocols such as the BGP, VLAN configuration or access control lists and firewalls. There is no single system that met our goals for a large-scale network experimentation configuration system. However, there are valuable contributions from each of these research projects. We would like to integrate these into a future framework. There's also been research into emulation and test beds. There are systems such as Emulab, which provide network configuration. These are generally designed for network experiments rather than be focused on large-scale routing topologies. Other systems such as Genie exist, which provide a large-scale network federated testbed to carry out experiments on. Finally, there is Mininet, which provides a platform in which container-based emulation is used to quickly and easily create networks. This is primarily focused on SGN, however could be used with systems such as Mininet Extreme to run Quagga and provide a similar testbed to that of NetKit. The work presented in this paper is primarily to configure an emulation system rather than providing the underlying emulation platform. As such, the work presented here could be adapted to be used in systems such as Emulab, Genie or Mininet configurations. Finally, clean slate network architectures such as presented originally with 4D and later becoming prominence with SDN, especially OpenFlow, have received much attention from both the research and network industries. This provides a promising future architecture. There are many benefits from SDN. However, there is a lot of existing network infrastructure out there running traditional network routing protocols. This provides future for network research into how to manage the systems better, how to study the network protocols and their behavior, and for operators to carry out test beds before deploying to their production networks. There is also a role for education of these traditional networks. An automation platform that allows experimentation on can also offer insights into network configuration. This could provide benefits to ease the transition from a traditional to an SDN or clean slate based approach in the future. We were unable to find a network configuration solution that met our specific goal for network emulation experimentation. We developed a couple of prototypes in order to understand the broader configuration problem. Our first prototype followed the script driven approach. A network model sat at the middle. We had physical and logical topologies expressed in a network description. The network model had resource allocation applied to it such as IP addresses providing an abstract view of the network. A number of plugins were used such as to provide optimization for traffic engineering. These were then used with a compiler which essentially took that resource model and policy such as expressed in a template format and generated configuration files. These were generated for the NetKit platform and deployed to the NetKit host through a series of scripts. We added a closed loop system in which verification was carried out. This was performed using trace routes, automating that step which took half a day in our previous experiment. This allowed the output of the trace routes to be used, mapped against those resources allocated in the IP addresses to list the paths used in the network. This verification step could map the paths used in the network against the predicted paths of the network model. This slide shows an example of the syntax used. The first step was to create an internet object. Inside this, autonomous system objects were created, such as for 1234 here. We then added the autonomous system to the internet object. Inside an autonomous system, we could add routers, such as A, B and C in this example. The final step was to add links between the routers. This raised the level of abstraction to provide an abstract model of how to configure network devices. The problem was that it became tedious to add more than a few devices. It did not scale very well. The greater problem was trying to express network level goals. We had a strict hierarchy of internetworks containing autonomous systems, which in turn contained routers and links. The routers contained interfaces that could connect these links. The challenge was expressing different topologies. For instance, the OSPF topology may be different to the physical topology, which may in turn differ from the IBGP topology. We might have routers such as Access and Backbone. These do not follow very well in this strict linear hierarchy. We wish to group these roles. This object-oriented model did not allow this easily. Our next iteration took the similar format, however we expanded the network model. We retained the compiler which used templates. The key difference was in this network model, in which we went from being object-oriented into providing multi-levels. At the top level was an abstract high-level model. This provided the connection topology. 
on this BGP policies could be added. The difference now was this abstract high-level model was graph-based. This allowed imports from a number of different formats instead of having to configure them using the Python-specific syntax. This enabled input from a GUI, such as a YED editor, a text editor, or a database. This is important as network data can be represented in different formats. This was then mapped down to an intermediate level in which physical links overlay graphs, BGP policies were implemented. Resource allocation, such as for IP addressing, was then performed, and this was mapped down to a network inventory database. This contained the IP addresses, the DNS graph, per session BGP policies, and the community values. This network inventory database was able to then be mapped directly into the templates to provide configuration files. This model approach allowed us to take a high-level abstract network view and map it down into a network inventory database which provided the device level view. NetworkX was used as the graph library in the middle. This allowed us to import from different formats and also to export for analysis and visualization. We started using overlay graphs, adding overlay graphs in to represent different elements. Initially, the physical topology was created. We then added graphs in to represent specific routing topologies such as IBGP, eBGP, OSPF, and DNS. These were added to the abstract high-level model. This was promising as a prototype, but used a lot of custom code, especially to add in each new routing protocol topology. We want to extend this approach and really refine it down to the essence of network configuration. This syntax also became quite unwieldy to get and set node and edge attribute and to access the nodes across graphs, such as the physical and mapping it to the IBGP graph when it came to configuration to build a network inventory database. We then revisited what exactly is going on with configuration. The fundamental task of network configuration is to distribute state to the network devices. This state has a network-wide context, but must be expressed in a device-specific format in the low-level configuration, whether that's Quagga, iOS, iOS XR, or a different format. We looked at how networks are designed in order to get insight into the configuration process. One way to express a network is on a level like a whiteboard or in Visio. In this example here, we have a network. Eight routers are shown by the circles here. We could add links to these routers, showing their physical connectivity. We can add groupings to show which networks they belong to and add specific values such as the autonomous system number for each corresponding network. We can then use this information such as the nodes, the links, and those attributes to represent the networks to start building routing protocol topologies. For instance, OSPF, an internal gateway protocol, only has links between routers in the same autonomous system. In this case, there are no links between the different autonomous systems. This could be inferred based on the previous slide or for external routing protocols such as BGP, we wish to connect routers that have a link in the physical topology but belong to different autonomous systems. In this case here, there are no links within the autonomous system, but there are links between them. This approach provided a fast and intuitive way to describe network behavior and seemed well suited for network experimentation. We want to explore this and see how we could adapt this into a system. It's not very easy to capture from a whiteboard without using image processing. So we took the next best thing, which was to design that in a tool. Here we're using YED, a graph drawing tool. It's similar to Visio or OmniGraphle. The advantage of YED is that you can add attributes to nodes easily and export that in a graph format. YED exports in the GraphML format, which is supported by NetworkX. This allows us to draw a graph visually, annotate it, and be able to load that file directly into NetworkX and work with it in Python. We can see here adding attributes such as the autonomous system number, and setting a node type to be a router. The problem is we don't want to just provide a one-size-fits-all network configuration solution. The challenge is enabling automatic configuration to simplify the process, but also allowing the specificity of a network in which one aspect needs to be modeled. We'd like an automated solution, such as for IP addressing, but when required, enable a user to specifically alter the part that they are interested in. We explored this idea further by using a tool such as YED to export a graph and then working with these attribute graphs. Here we are showing the small internet that was shown previously for NetKit. We have represented this as a graph with nodes, edges, and boxes around nodes representing the attribute ASN. We can define a function which takes the node and returns the ASN that that node belongs to. We could call this FASN. We could use a similar approach to BAP properties of an arbitrary user-defined attribute to an output format. This allows us to scale this approach. 
For instance, FASN of router 1 will return 1. FASN 2 of router 2, which belongs to autonomous system 20, will return 20. And so on, 9 will return the ASN 100. We can then start to build up our topology design rules from this. For instance, we can define the OSPF edge list, EOSPF, to be the set of all edges from the input topology where the ASN of the router I is equal to the ASN of the router J. This essentially returns only the physical links that were present in the original input graph that belong to the same AS. This is similar to our whiteboard example. We can define a similar algebraic rule for BGP. Here, the edge set for BGP will be the nodes where the ASN is different. We can also construct new edge sets based on properties. For instance, IBGP, in which we want to connect all of the routers together in a click for the devices that belong to the same AS. We can define the edge set IJ to be the set of nodes from the input graph where the ASN of the node is equal to the ASN of the other node. This creates a full mesh within each ASN. For each of these rules, we've only defined the edge sets. We could perform a similar rule based on the node attributes, such as to filter out routers or switches to build higher level protocol graphs. Resource allocation also works in this approach. We wish to use sensible defaults such as for IP addressing if the user doesn't specify, but also allow them to define a custom function. For instance, for IP addressing, we can define a sensible default which takes a sequence of numbers and maps them onto the nodes such as allocating a function that provides an IP address for each subnet for each AS. This includes a loopback for each node and an interface IP to each edge. But the aim of a configuration system is to generate per device state in a simple way. The compiler step condenses the overlay graph shown on the previous slides into the device specific attributes. We wish to create a resource vector for each device. These resources can be viewed the same as a resource database in a script-driven approach. These can then be pushed out to the individual devices. We can define a function fr which creates the resource vector, the output of which is gr which is the resource graph. This function takes the overlay graphs such as the physical, IP, OSPF, IBGP, EBGP or other user-defined graphs and outputs this vector. These properties represent such as the physical connectivity, so this device connects to routers 1, 2, 3 and 4, which can go into the interface configuration stanza. The OSPF connectivity, such as the remote neighbor that it's connecting to, and the cost, such as 10 to router 2 or 100 to router 4. IBGP connectivity, showing that there is a connection to router 2 and router 4. And EBGP connectivity, showing there's a connection to router 1. This compiler step can also handle the different syntax format required for different devices. For instance, we could present them in this vector format, showing, for instance, for a different router configuration, the physical interface and the OSPF cost combined, the OSPF in their separate connections, such as for iOS XR, IBGP connectivity, and EBGP connectivity. By decoupling the network design rule shown on previous slides with this compilation step, we can handle network protocol configuration in a device independent manner and also handle the different variations between device configurations in how they express their semantics. If we view this in form of the script configuration, this step is essentially performing that resource database. We can then use that resource database with this script and the configuration template to generate router configuration files. This approach has allowed us to decouple the design rules from the input so we can have a single input topology apply the automated design rules and get our output device configurations. We can modify that input, apply the same function and get different output for that new experiment. This is very important for network experimentation as we can easily and at low cost modify the input topology, changing the experiment and observing the output. This attribute based approach decouples the design from the input and encourages network experimentation. The function fr maps the physical IP, OSPF, IBGP, EBGP and other user-defined protocol graphs into the resource graph GR. We could take this one step further. Each of these physical IP etc. graphs are defined by a function of the input. Resource graph, which is then pushed straight into the templates, is then a function of the input topology. This forms a high-level model used in our system in which the input graph, such as expressed in GraphML, is loaded into a network X graph. This forms the input graph GN. The functions then create the various overlay topologies, again such as physical, OSPF, IBGP, EBGP, according to the user-defined design rules. 
the compiler takes these overlay graphs and maps them down to that resource graph GR. These are then suitable to be pushed directly into device configuration templates. It is also worth noting that a user can keep the same input topology such as expressed in GraphML and modify the design rules that map G in to the overlay topology. For instance, IBGP could be modified from a full mesh to route reflection without needing to modify the input design so you can keep the same topology as previously without modifying the output so the same templates used can be applied. This is important as it allows experimentation not only with the input topologies but also in the design rules. We've implemented this abstract model in our system implementation. Attributes and graphs themselves aren't new for networking. Almost every theoretical paper uses them. They have potential, but how well do they work in network configuration? The key is to make it user friendly, especially with coding and APIs. The algebraic approach can form a good basis in theory, but to use it for user friendly experimentation requires building an API on top of it. The contribution in this section is a reference implementation of a multi layer attribute graph based system for network configuration. Our reference implementation has been implemented in the Python programming language. Python was chosen as it is cross-platform. There's a wealth of packages that we can build on. It's easy to understand for basic scripting. This is important for researchers who may not be familiar with the language that we've chosen and for network operators. It also has list comprehensions. List comprehensions allow functional programming to be used. This is especially important when we're dealing with large lists of data. For instance, here we have a list of the integers between one and 10. A simple list comprehension can be used to filter out that are even. This approach lends itself quite well to network configuration where we're dealing with lists of nodes and edges and the attributes based on them. Much of our system implementation has been built using this approach. We've used the NetworkX package, which is written in Python and provides network algorithms. Here it is showing the NetworkX library using the read GraphML function to read in the small internet GraphML. This is the drawing that was shown in YED on previous slides. From here we can print out the list of the nodes, the list of the edges, and the data on the nodes. Here we can see those annotations which were shown, such as the label, the X and Y position, and the ASN attribute. The problem is that these are not so user friendly for network configuration. Our implementation, Auto NetKit, essentially wraps the framework showed on previous slides using NetworkX and adds some syntactic sugar to make it user friendly. This allows easy set and get of the node and edge attributes in the graph properties while still providing access to the underlying network X graphs and algorithms. This allows the benefit of the import and export and the algorithms such as spanning tree, shortest paths and minimum sets. This is the overall system flow chart. Most of the external bits such as the device configuration, deployment and measurement are similar to previous versions. They are incremental improvements on versions 1 and version 2. It is the configuration generation system shown in the dashed lines here that has been rebuilt. The input topology is taken into the network design rules. These are responsible for mapping the input topology G in to the overlays such as OSPF and BGP. The compiler takes these overlays and maps them down to the device database. This is used in the configuration generation step which takes templates and this database to generate the device configurations. We'll first focus on this configuration system. The API forms an important part of our implementation. Here is a reference model that we used previously. A user can access our abstract network model accessing the various overlays. Here we're looking at input which represents the GIN input graph. The nodes function will show us the nodes which are listed by their label. Here the label has been defined as a function of both the router name, R1, R2, R3, etc concatenated with the autonomous system number. High level rules allow this naming structure to be defined. We can start to perform list comprehensions, such as selecting the nodes using a Python list comprehension in that sequence, which is the node set of the input graph, if a property is matched. Here that property is set to be the ASN is equivalent to 300, and we can see the routers from there. We can also define a reference to a node. For instance, the node R11 in the input graph. We can then access the ASN such as the ASN property, and also set properties such as the color. Here we're setting the color property to be red. This attribute syntax allows us to easily set and get attribute values. These attributes can either be set manually by the user in their script, or could be accessed from the underlying input topology. For instance, an attribute such as color set in YED will be then persisted across and accessible in the network X inside AutoNetKit. We can now do a selection here using our querying syntax 
This is similar to the selection syntax shown using the list comprehensions, but provides another method in a single line. This is suitable for fast and simple queries. More complex queries can use list comprehensions. Here we are selecting all the nodes from the input graph where the colour is set to red. This only matches the colour that we set. We also make it simple to add new overlays, for instance an overlay for the OSPF nodes. Here we are selecting all the nodes using a list comprehension from the input graph. We are selecting the edges based on these nodes. Here we are using the shortcut provided by AutoNetKit for the edges where we can access the source and the destination nodes using the .src and .dst syntax. Here we are providing the edge list of all the edges from the input graph where the source ASN does not match the destination ASN. This here could be used to add the links into the OSPF graph created in the previous line. This Auto Netkit API makes it simple to set, get and work with lists of nodes and edges based on their attributes. By building attributes based on other attributes we can quickly and easily create large complex network designs in a simple amount of code. This syntax shows accessing the phi graph created by default as gphi, adding nodes from the input graph and retaining some attributes, namely the ASN, label and route reflector attributes. We can also add edges using a similar syntax. We can then list the nodes and the edges, printing them out to the user. Here is the list of the nodes, and here is the list of edges. What quickly becomes apparent is that this list of nodes and edges becomes hard to work with. Have we added an extra node? Have we added an extra link or removed one? The links are particularly problematic, as these are defined based on the node attributes, and an extra link or one missing can be quite hard to spot, but can have profound implications for the configuration. This motivates the creation of a real-time visualisation engine to show the user their nodes, links and the attributes on these nodes and links. Any differences from what was intended quickly become apparent. The web server allows for visualisation. This can be started as is part of the default AutoNetKit distribution. A command is used to send the abstract network model across to this web server. This is sent in JSON format and the result is a network topology view in the browser. This is built on d3.js and allows the user to select the overlay, the attributes to display such as the link label, the node label or other attributes and filtering based on the nodes. Here we can see physical overlay. The colours indicate the ASN attribute where nodes are grouped by the ASN. We can see this resembles the original small internet topology. This can act as both a design time debugging tool to check that the design rules such as the OSPF or IBGP design rules are created correctly and a runtime confirmation tool to check that the attributes set of the input topology have resulted in the correct output topology. For instance, here is the rules to create the physical topology based on the input graph. Here is the OSPF rules which is basically taking the input graph, adding the same nodes and adding the edges which belong to the same ASN. This is showing the eBGP graph, which is directed. AutoNetKit represents BGP sessions as directed edges. We are using the similar rule to OSPF, except we are matching where the source and destination ASNs are different. We can then see this matches what we would like in the visualization. And finally, for iBGP, we are forming a full mesh where we are adding a link for all nodes if the source destination match for the ASN. We can see that the topology looks as intended again. The visualization engine can be extended further. Here is a prototype using the 3.js JavaScript visualization system for 3D. We are using the same topology sent to the server and are viewing them in a 3D format. This can be updated live based on the user input topology. Here we can see the physical topology on the bottom, the OSPF on the second layer, IBGP and eBGP. The user can pan and scroll around this topology. The design rules can be extended further independently of the other protocols. For instance, here we've extended the IPGP design rules. We've used this to build two-layer route reflection. In this, we can denote the role of a router to be a route reflector, a route reflector client, or a hierarchical route reflector. We can define rules such as clusters. The hierarchical route reflectors will appear in the same cluster, route reflectors will appear globally. The advantage of a design rule based system such as this and the input topology is that the user only needs to annotate the nodes with the cluster a route reflector belongs to and the role of the router. From this we can quickly and easily construct the high level design rules and show the output in the visualisation. The visualisation becomes very powerful for debugging such rules. The approach can also be used to configure networks such as MPLS VPNs. Here we can simply tag a router as the VRF it belongs to such as red or blue and build the rules from there. Routers which connect to a router tagged with a VRF become PE devices provided edge. 
routers which are neither tagged with a VRF or connected directly to one become key devices. We can then construct the rules from there. These visualizations show the design rules created. This approach allows a user to easily tag just a single device or multiple devices and have the rest of the topology created automatically from there with the appropriate device configuration stanzas. The following slides show a real-world example of where the configuration engine was used in an experiment. In this example, we want to have a special handling if a server is connected to an external tap connection to wire to the outside world. The first example up the top is simple. Here we just have the server connected directly to the tap. However, the bottom rule is more complicated. Here, the server, S2, over on the right, is connected to the tap 2 down the bottom. However, this is connected through another node, which is acting as a switch. What we wish to do is because on the layer 2 connectivity, this switch is directly connected to the tap. However, it's not in the physical topology graph. This is the power of the graph-based topology design rules, where by creating various overlays, we can quickly reason about network properties and create the appropriate stanza. The top interface can be easily detected by looking at direct node connectivity. We'll focus on this bottom interface. The first step is to define some graph operations built with AutoNetKit. The explode function takes a single node and its directly connected neighbors and creates a click of the neighbors. Here, node two is connected to nodes one, three, four, and five. This function takes a Cartesian product of this node set and generates an edge set of one to two, one to three, one to four, etc. This takes the graph on the left, and creates the graph on the right. We can use this to build a layer three connectivity from a layer two graph such as switches. Up the top, we're showing the layer two graph down the bottom we're showing the layer 3 graph, which is the IP connectivity. Here we can see the switches being exploded, both the switch between router 1 and router 2, and most noticeably between router 2, switch 2, router 3, and tap 2. We can see the full click there. We can now use our high-level API. Here we're using an iteration over all of the nodes where the device type is equal to the server. We then select the interfaces shown in red here of those devices. Here we're iterating over the physical interfaces, so we do not select the loopbacks. The next step is to select the interface corresponding to this physical interface in the corresponding graph, the layer 3 connectivity graph. We use this to look at layer 3 connectivity of that interface. This uses a similar syntax before that we were selecting for the nodes across a different graph. Here we're using that to now select an interface. The next step uses the power of Python list comprehensions and the API to perform a succinct operation. What we wish to do is select the neighbors which are connected to these physical nodes. We then look as the previous step at the layer 3 interface and we look at the peer of that layer 3 interface. This will be the interface of the other node in the layer 3 graph. The first step is using the list comprehension to iterate over all of the neighbors of the layer 3 interface. These are shown in the red here. This is different to previously as now an interface of server 2 is instead of being the switch because we are now looking at the layer 3 graph that interface is now the directly connected layer 3 node, such as the tap, the router 3, or router 2. This is what we're using in our logic. We're not so much interested in the connected interface as the node that is connected to. So we use this interface syntax and access the parent of the interface. This gives us the node, such as tap 2, router 3, and router 2. We do not so much care about the layer 3 node but instead use our same syntax mapping to jump back to the physical graph of the parent node. Here we're accessing the physical node corresponding to the interface. In this way, we've determined that the server 2 is connected to router 2, router 3, and tap 2. We can now perform the code that we wish to. Here, what we are doing is doing an any query to say that if any of the layer 3 neighbors, such as router 2, router 3, and tap 2, if any of those have a device type set to tap, we then perform our appropriate coding. Alternatively, we can continue or have general handling code. There's quite a few steps going on here. However, the high-level API provides an interface that allows complicated graph queries, including exploding out switches from layer 2 to layer 3 connectivity and mapping between different protocol overlays to become quite simple using only nine lines of code. These code can be broken into multiple steps for clarity if required. The next step after the abstract network model has been used to create the network topologies is to generate the device configurations. The resource database is the output of the compiler, which maps the high-level network models into the resource database. This is in the specific device semantic format. The configuration generation step takes the resource database and uses templates. These templates contain placeholders the resource database attributes can be mapped into. The output is in configuration in the appropriate format 
using both the semantics of the resource database and the syntax of the templates. This can support iOS, Quagga, Junos, CBGP or other formats. As the compiler allows for different semantics of different output target formats to be supported, the templates become quite simple. This is important as it allows portability. The templates support variable substitution, iteration such as over the interfaces of a node, and if-then-else statements for conditionals. All other logic and data formatting should be performed in the compilation step. This simplifies the templates. One insight that we learned in version 2 of our prototype was to decouple the device and the platform configuration. The device configuration uses the standard object-oriented behaviour to allow us to encapsulate common behaviour using inheritance. For instance, all devices can inherit from a common device and then we have a server and router. The platform compiler, on the other hand, is responsible for the platform-specific configuration, for instance on NetKit or Dynagen or Junosphere. Here we can mix and match different formats, such as Bind DNS Server may run on multiple platforms. The syntax used with the device, whether it's to a Cisco hardware device or emulation, so Dynagen, may be the same. However, the platform compilation requirements may be different, for instance the interfaces for management or interface numbering scheme. The platform compiler can handle these platform-specific implementation details while the device compiler is responsible for just the device syntax. This allows it easy to use the same device on multiple platforms and to map to hardware devices in the future. This slide shows the output of the dictionary that gives the results database. This is the output of the compilation step. We can see for a node the properties such as the ASN being set to 300 and then the BGP stanza debug is set to true. The eBGP neighbors, here we have a neighbor 10.5.0.1 we also have IBGP neighbours, all within the same AS of 300. We can see the loopback address to peer to, and the neighbour name to add as a description. We can also denote whether to use IPv4 or IPv6. These properties are shown here in JSON format, but can be edited and pushed straight into the templates if required, providing that transparency to the end user. This slide shows an example of a template. This takes those properties shown on the previous slide and uses a number of configuration elements. Here, we use interpolation, shown with the dollar sign and the curly braces, for instance to interpolate the node ASN or loopback. We can also use iteration to iterate over the subnets to advertise, the IBGP neighbours shown on the previous slide, and the eBGP neighbours. Here we are using the semantics mapped from the compilation step that in turn was mapped from the high level design rules that was in turn itself mapped from the input graph. These resources are then interpolated in this correct semantic format into the syntax required using this template. This provides a transparent way at each step of the process to generate low-level device-specific configurations. The output of this template is shown down the bottom in the black. This is taking the previous slide showing the JSON format, the device-specific syntax from the template and the semantics and mapping them to the output format. It's important to note that this output from the NIDB need not be for a specific template. This could be used to output to a format such as YAML or CSV and used in an alternate step. For instance, instead of using the template shown here, the output could be pushed to something like Ansible or another DevOps tool, or output to a specific format that could be used with an interface such as 1PK. Our tool has been built initially in the prototype stage to output to the NetKit emulation platform. We have also extended it to support other formats. Here we are showing the output for NetKit, taking that small internet graph which was drawn in YED and showing after each of the design mapping rules compilation and configuration generation, the output. Here we can see a configuration for each device, AS1R1, AS20R1, AS20R2 and so on. This example was showing the OSPF configuration for one device. This is taking the mapping of the high level network protocol design rules, compilation step to the semantics and output to the template and showing the output including IP addresses allocated. There are a lot of configurations generated even for a small network. By generating each of these from a high level network diagram or input graph, it becomes quick and easy to create experiments. Our system also provides for automated deployment and collection. This facilitates rapid network experimentation without needing to perform the steps of deployment and collection manually. Automated configuration makes it easy to generate large numbers of configurations, but it still is tedious to start and stop the experiment or to collect data from it. We automate these steps with a scriptable deployment and data collection. That completes the closed loop diagram shown here. With the input topology, network design rules, compilation step and configuration generation used with a combination of templates to generate device configurations, the deployment step will take these device configurations and launch them on an emulation server. 
The emulated network can then be measured using collection commands and the output used as part of the visualization. This can be compared using plugins, which can either do the comparison and verification to compare the output to the network design rules to validate the configuration, or plugins which act directly on the network design rule, such as to perform optimizations. We will now present a number of case studies showing the system in action. Firstly, the original small internet that we set out to automate that initially took over two days to build and motivated our initial automation tool. We will then show a large scale example, an example from research, and then some real world research building on top of the system. The first example is a video recording showing design workflow for the small internet diagram. Using YED, we can draw by drag and dropping the network topology. This has been sped up to show the design steps fast. We initially draw the networks, create links between them. We treat undirected edges. So the directed edges shown here will be mapped in the physical topology to undirected. The next step is to run AutoNetKit across that small internet graph ML. We see the output there. In the visualization, we can see the output steps, for instance, OSPF and IBGP using the design rules described in Python. The next step is deployment. This will generate those configuration files, zip them up, and transfer them across. The lab launching step has been sped up. This normally takes one to two minutes to launch a lab. We can then log into each of the routers. We now have a full routing table just from drawing a network diagram with automatic resources such as IP addresses. We've also created a larger scale network model using networks from the Internet Topology Zoo, a collection online of the graphs of network topologies. These network topologies have been collected from network maps provided by network operators. We've taken these topologies from the European research networks and using GIARD and inferring connectivity created a network of 1400 nodes. By using the ASN attribute on a network, we've been able to infer whether the network connections and their connectivity are IBGP, IGP and EBGP. This allows us to create a network with multiple autonomous systems connecting together, allowing us to perform realistic experiments such as trace routes or building experiments on top of them. Using NetKit at approximately 32 megabytes of RAM per device, this allows us to run a thousand node topology in about 20 gigabytes of RAM, which is not unrealistic on a large server. The performance constraint of Auto NetKit was typically in the disk I.O. to write out the configurations, not so much in the actual data structures used. Since these input topology was created using GraphML files, we can use the same format that we used for the small internet created in YED. All the design rules remain the same, for instance for OSPF and IBGP. We did find that a full mesh of IBGP became quite complex for large networks. The solution was to use route reflectors by annotating a number of nodes central to the network. Details are provided in the paper as route reflectors. This is a real world problem, not a limitation of auto net kit. In a real world, a full mesh of network devices can quickly become complicated. The scalable solution is to designate some routers as route reflectors and create a hierarchy. As we wrap around network X graphs, which themselves are Python dictionaries, objects are created on the fly in auto net kit. This allows for high performance. This network with 1400 routers only took a couple of minutes to create. The system has also been used in validating research. Here we're using the bad gadget theoretical example of a topology that will oscillate. Here what will happen is the combination of the physical routers, the links and the OSPF costs, as well as the route reflector hierarchy will result in routes being received at the routers in ASX such that routes received from ASY will oscillate. This means that the prefix P will be seen as going through one path then the next path, and then back. This is bad for network performance. Such theoretical results can be useful in real-world networks to validate and to highlight problems that may occur. What we're using here is the Auto NetKit framework to apply these theoretical results and validate whether they occur on production control plane hardware. router and iOS router. It did not occur in Quagga. Deep investigation confirmed this was due to the way that Quagga does the BGP decision process. This is what the design looked like and yet here we have both the physical topology and annotations for the links attributes. The route reflectors were drawn using the route reflector clusters and attributes to 
create the route reflector hierarchy. This example shows the value of testing research on real-world devices. Finally, the system has been used for real-world research. The RPKI experiment with 800 virtual machines spread across two physical locations. AutoNet was used to configure service topology for the RPKI infrastructure as well as the routing protocols. AutoNet has also been used in the PADIS demo at SITCOM 2012 where the Linux traffic control was used to set bandwidth delay on links for CDN evaluation. Auto NetKit and the underlying NetKit emulation platform were used to host the experiment with Quagga running routing protocols between ASs and within ASs with HTTP servers sitting on the side. This shows the value of using emulation as services can be run on top of a routed network enabling application level experimentation. This has covered the system to date. There are a number of next steps that could be taken in the future. One is export formats. The compiler and NIDB process need not only be used for template compilation. They could export to XML, YAML, etc. These could be then used, as mentioned previously, for an API 1PK for NetConf or custom scripts. This allows flexibility in each of these components. We can support new input formats. We can add new topology design rules, such as for IBGP or a new routing protocol. And we can support new devices or new hardware deployment platforms. The platform compiler can also be extended to develop for hardware configurations, such as specific interface allocations. We can also map with custom IP allocations by providing a custom IP resource allocation function. This can use just the own IP addresses without needing to touch any of the other components of the system. This modularity is quite powerful. The workflow can also be extended. This could be used to output the same resources using the resource database and compilation steps to multiple different targets. For instance, design and algorithms could be used as analysis on the network model. An output could then be performed to a sim. Emulation could be the next output target to test how it works in an emulated network. The same system could also be used to deploy to a testbed network. And finally, production. This provides a production network workflow that follows test-driven networking. which values have changed or transitioned. This could be used to tie the output into work such as stable migrations or Pac-Man or other systems which take the changed topologies and will output that to the network in a safe manner. There is a role for offline analysis on the model, for instance, looking at Another option is performing network X functions such as shortest paths. Here we can list the shortest path between two nodes. If we annotate topologies with attributes such as link cost, we can use that as part of this shortest path calculation. We can also perform this as part of our visualization system, for instance, plotting the path in the visualization engine. This can also be used with traceroute, for instance, collecting the traceroute output using the collection framework, mapping this since we know the IPs to map back to the nodes and then creating the node list. This could also be sent to the visualization. However, while it may be visually apparent, it is not suitable for large scale for lots of source destination pairs, but also not rigorous. An alternative is to take the path. Since the pass path of the network X output and also from the traceroute output are both lists, we can compare the two. This allows powerful test driven networking. This allows us to automatically configure and confirm that the experiment is valid. For instance, once OSPF and other routing protocols have converged, it also lets us confirm that the network has come up according and that there have been no problems in the emulation system. This improves the rigidity of the research outcome since we know that the network is in a safe and stable and well-defined state before we conduct our experiment. This can be extended further, for instance, in visualizing OSPF convergence. Here the framework is used, parsing the output using TextFSM, a Python module, mapping against the IP addresses allocated, and sending the paths to the visualization system. A video of this example is shown on the AutoNetKit YouTube page. Here we can see the router as the network is first brought up. Here all the routes that are seen, which is not every route, but a number of them, are seen through one router. At the next step of measurement, we can see that a number of other routers have become announcing paths. Some of these have now moved to the different bundles, showing the alternate best paths. 
As the network slowly starts to converge, new routes appear and more routes are shown through these alternate routers. As further network convergence occurs, we can see the connection to each network subnet and the different paths that it takes. What we could now do is remove OSPF from one of these routers and see the updated topology change. What we would like to do is use this platform to form a community ecosystem. The modularity of the framework allows design rules to be shared. The users can include teaching, ISPs and experiment configuration. For instance, the system is used to bootstrap configurations in Cisco's virtual internet routing lab, the viral platform. The open format also means input topologies can be shared, such as the large-scale NREN example. Working examples of experiment documentation can also be shared. This is very important for reproducible research. We have shown our paper of AutoNet Kit. We have used attribute graphs to configure network protocols and the services. We have shown a decoupling of the input topology and design rules and the power this affords. We have shown network level design but generating device level configurations. We have implemented this as a working extensible open source system that is available for download. This is a high level overview of how the system works. Thank you.